Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm going to be talking about the, the big picture here, and I'm aware, full, very uh, painfully aware, actually, of my incompetence as a PowerPoint designer, uh, but also that I'm in a room full of engineers who are very concrete, pragmatic people in general. Um, and, um, I, um, and I'm going to be, in a, I'm a social scientist by training, and uh, I've always admired engineers, and if I'd had a kind of, you know, a, a multiverse situation, I would, might have been an architect or something. Um, but uh, so I, I uh, uh, appreciate the opportunity to come and talk with you all. Um, and I hope that you'll um, give me a little bit of forbearance on the question of you know, how can we get to there, um, given the, uh, the magnitude of the challenges that we face and, uh, in trying to implement them. So um, le let me, let me uh, paint a, a broad picture for you to set the stage. Um, um, after that great introduction, uh, Janine, thank you, and, and John, your work to getting us all here. It's a, um, it's a real honor to be able to speak with you all. Um, I teach a couple of courses on about climate change, uh, environment, energy. Uh, this semester, um, for the second time, I'm teaching a course uh, that I've titled God, Gaia, and Government for undergraduates. It's uh, an effort to try to connect to some of the deeper questions, I think, that underlie the, uh, the posture that uh, we as developed, uh, a major developed economy uh, have with respect to the way we think about the environment, the way we think about nature. Uh, and it turns out there's some pretty interesting scholarship in that field that takes us all the way back to medieval uh, Europe and the development of uh, monotheistic religions uh, organized around uh, the Christian churches in the early days. Um, I won't go into the details of that just now, but I want to signal right at the outset the, net, the magnitude of the challenge here, I think, is more than just a solution that we can draw up on a drawing board, uh, but that it has deep cultural and social uh, and organizational uh, elements to it that I think I'd like to try to spend a few minutes uh, this afternoon to elevate a little bit. Uh, not to be daunting, uh, but to, to, to be realistic about what it is that we really need to do if we're going to achieve the targets, I think, that um, are now being set before us. Um, Jeanine, you posted pictures from recent science reports. Uh, the one and a half degree report, report that was published uh, just a few months ago uh, that suggests that um, we need, according to the science, the international scientific community, uh, we need to reduce our carbon emissions um, to 45% of 2010 levels by 2030. That's 12 years. Let me make this thing go. 12 years. So I'm telling my students in this uh, course about religion and climate change that we have 12 years until the apocalypse. And I'm using language that's drawn from biblical texts because that's what people in the religious community are doing. That's what people in the community of people that think about, religion, uh, about morality are doing. Uh, moral politics, uh, um, moral philosophy um, points us in the direction of thinking in these more apocalyptic terms than I think usually we have uh, accustomed ourselves to, to be thinking in. Um, we need to have net zero carbon emissions by 2050. The magnitude of that challenge is absolutely historically unprecedented. There's just no comparable effort, not to create a device or uh, nuclear weapons, for example, is a major uh, effort that uh, took place over a very short period of time historically, but it wasn't a big system. Um, and what I think is implied by the transition, the energy transition, is not just getting to net zero by 2050, um, but it's merging major technical systems, the energy systems, and the information systems that are going to be required for smart grid management um, across the board is a truly uh, unprecedented uh, technical feat that we're society, civilization even, is being asked to take on. So I don't want to be too depressing about this, and my students groan every time I pull this out, but I think to be realistic is really what we need to do uh, here. Uh, the consequences of missing these targets um, are pretty, ser pretty serious. I don't think I need to describe those in detail to this audience. Um, I have used and asked my students to use something called C-Learn, which is a computer program that uh, web available that's put together by Climate Interactive, which is a group that is an offshoot of a research team at MIT. 
uh, that allows you to play around with targets and target setting and um, that uh, in a real-time uh, uh, capacity, you can fool around with this stuff um, without having to know very much about programming or modeling. Um, C-Learn is, uh, I haven't given you the information about it but, um, here, but it's, it's worth um, logging into and trying it out. Try to get to a degree and a half Celsius in a time frame like we're talking about here. It's really, really hard. I have not been able to do it. Pull out all the stops, make everything you know, maximal reforestation, maximal tar carbon taxation, maximal solutions that we've all, we're all familiar with, and it's, it's hard to see how it could be done. Um, so setting the stage here is simple, that it's really hard, uh, the task that we have. Um, it's not being made much better by the fact that um, the Trump administration currently is not helping us. This is the timeline from the National Geographic. I've made it really, whoops. I've made it purposefully small so I could fit it all on one screen. Um, it's, it's endless. You uh, scroll through the National Geographic's rendition of all the environmental and energy related uh, policy uh, actions that have been taken. It's a major rollback. So we have serious headwinds here um, to try to um, achieve the, um, the targets that now we know uh, definitively, more or less, um, uh, have been set before us by the science community. Uh, science is continually attacked at the highest levels of the administration. Um, federal workers are demoralized and leaving. They're not being replaced. Um, the skill and knowledge and experience is walking out the door and um, the federal agencies are feeling uh, an impending sense of, um, well, significant challenge, I think. Um, the prospect of climate legislation, at least at the moment, despite the Green New Deal resolution, and, the, and I'll mention that in a few minutes in, in a somewhat different context, but uh, the prospect for uh, dramatic legislation on the, of the sort that we need to, to achieve a 12-year target is um, sadly remote. Yet, science and technology and policy developments are proceeding, and I think I want to emphasize this immediately after being terribly depressing about all this because this is what you all, this is what we all are about here. Um, this is a moment, uh, this is a, an era in which building social capital, building intellectual capital, building political capital to achieve the great challenges we have uh, is, the, is the order of the day, is the task we need to be engaged in. Um, so, the, among the, the um, the developments that are worth noting briefly, and I'm going to throw, throw up a bunch of, uh, a few slides here that will kind of uh, illustrate this. Scientific work in chemistry and in physics and biology of energy and carbon sequestration conversion continues. Um, my own son is a physical chemist at uh, Northwestern University who's working on uh, artificial photosynthesis at a fundamental physics level. Um, I'm proud of the work that he's doing. He's not doing it because of me, but it's, uh, you know, people in the same family, uh, Finally, finding, their own, finding their own ways to a common goal is a, is a lovely uh, personal and family development. Um, the renewable, this clicker is a little bit. Do I, should I point it somewhere? There we go. Um, in addition to the scientific uh, achievements that we've um, um, been accumulating, um, the um, improvements in renewable energy technologies are continuing. These curves ought to be familiar to everybody in your business, um, our business, but they're very encouraging. They're, um, and I think signal the most concrete evidence of, of what kind of progress we can make. Um, states, and, um, and we're doing policy experimentation as well. States, uh, countries are um, finding ways to um, um, within the realm that they are responsible for of uh, innovating in policy terms. Uh, carbon taxation, for example, these are maps. Uh, this map is from um, the, I uh, can't remember now exactly where it's from, um, let's say here, from the World Bank's um, uh, carbon pricing uh, project where they show uh, not only where carbon pricing uh, efforts are taking place but what the level prices are. Um, and in China, for example, there's a number 
on the, of cities on the right-hand side where carbon prices are being f uh, rather vigorously experimented with. Um, States are getting in on the act. Uh, you may recall a few years ago at the beginning of the, the Trump administration that Jerry Brown at the American Geophysical Union announced that if uh, uh, we need to, we'll, California will, will launch its own damn satellites to keep climate data rolling in to the science community. Um, decarbonization, stra oh, and, uh, sorry, and, um, and public attitudes are shifting. This is a climate opinion map from the Yale University uh, climate uh, communications program uh, that shows uh, by county across the United States what the people think climate, uh, whether climate, whether global warming is happening. Um, and uh, the average for the whole United States is 70 percent. That's a public attitude shift over time uh, that represents real progress in uh, persuading the society that uh, there are issues that um, uh, this is an issue that we need uh, to pay close attention to. The Green New Deal uh, is a, uh, a positive policy development uh, that suggests that, that climate attitudes are changing. And we have students who are going on strike in Europe and in some places in the United States because they don't think that their leadership is doing enough to respond to the challenges that are going to affect students more than um, anybody else. Um, in addition, we have um, but we have a number of decarbonization strategies that, strategies that already exist. Uh, this is the famous um, Pakala and Sokolo carbonization, uh, stabilization wedge scheme that was published in, I think, early 2000s uh, that suggests that we have the technologies if we only would apply them. The Deep Decarbonization, deep decarbonization Pathways Project similarly has carbonization strate, decarbonization strategies. The um, Paul Hawkins-led group um, the called Drawdown has a number of quite different strategies, including uh, if you see from the top, the biggest uh, strategy is uh, controlling refrigeration leakage, uh, wind turbines, re reduce food waste, plant-rich diets, tropical forests, educating girls, and family planning as climate solutions. I think this is a brilliant way for this community to enlarge the kinds of solutions as we think about what transition means. And it introduces a much more social and cultural component to the discussion than the decarbonization strategies that are driven largely by the physics and technical communities. Rightly so, but we're coming to a point now in our uh, civilization crisis that we need to enlarge the, the terrain on which um, we build solutions. And we also have a general shift in energy prices and use because of earlier technological achievements, particularly in uh, fracking, um, it has its own problems uh, from a water point of view and a materials point of view, but uh, we do see shifts in uh, efficiency uh, that are noteworthy, and we should applaud them uh, where we find them. And these are because of market forces, not because of a, of a dramatic political campaign. Um, Nevertheless, we need more creativity uh, in the responses to uh, the problems that we have. And many of these solutions are, will require creative political configurations and solutions, um, in addition to the technical and technological ones. We have a number of asset, fossil assets that are still in the ground, and we need to figure out a way to keep them there. Companies that have identified them and then put them on their books as, uh, as reserves are uh, counting them as assets, and if they were be, to be prevented from taking them out of the ground, they would suffer significant financial losses. So we need to address that problem. It's a real problem and consideration for them. Um, we need to think about investments in smart infrastructure. This is the uh, um, demand management um, institutional set of uh, relationships that need to be established. Uh, in addition to simply establishing new infrastructure to get power from regions where renewable energy is produced to places where it needs to be consumed. Um, that's a big, big deal, and we may be able to come to some agreement about that in the next year or two, um, but it's a big enterprise. We also need to eliminate subsidies. Subsidies are um, invisible in many respects. Um, they're traditional, and we think they're part of the landscape, but in fact, these figures, for example, suggest that the fossil fuel industry is subsidized to the tune of $70 billion a year, which if you were to remove subsidies, then all of a sudden prices would look very different 
um, and much more attractive in favor of renewables. There are many regions in the United States now where renewable prices are actually at par with um, co conventional fuels. And if you think about the subsidy scheme that already skews that, then you can imagine some terrific uh, improvements quite quickly if one were to eliminate subsidies. Um, and then introduce a proper taxation scheme. Internalize externalities. Um, labor force considerations are also a part of the story. This is uh, from the um, ARENA uh, publication uh, about renewable energy and jobs annual review from last year. Uh, jobs are uh, increasing in the sector dramatically, and I think many of you are probably uh, more acutely aware of that phenomenon than, than many. Um, but there are significant skill issues, there are significant location issues, and there's a retraining phenomenon that we need to, need to be very much uh, aware of. Um, parts of the economy that will, be, that will suffer from the decline of fossil fuels are um, in sectors of the society where people are feeling dishonored by the shift uh, to the way the economy is functioning. And that fuels political backlash that retards the growth of the renewable sector. Um, so let me talk briefly here about what it means to um, shift gears and to, to think more creatively about the problem. The language that we're using, as I said, is more and more apocalyptic. We need to think more broadly and more societally wide rather than technically uh, about what's required uh, to address the, the problem. Terms like just transition, as in justice in transition, are being used. So we need to think as broadly as uh, we can about the, the social and institutional elements um, of the, what, what a transition entails. Um, how close to the edge are we willing to go to confronting an apocalypse? So, thinking then concretely about energy transitions. This is um, some work that I've been doing over the last years, uh, and this is just a very simple uh, schematic uh, but I'd like you to imagine to think about how technologies are not just things. Um, technologies are really social technical systems. At the center here we have technologies, but every technology is embedded in an organization. Uh, and an organization is in a political and economic system that sets the rules for how the, how the organizations function. And the political and economic systems exist in a societal setting and a cultural setting. Those are all related to each other. It's really not a question of what, uh, of what a technology is. It's a question of who a technology is. The shift in emphasis is important. Because if it's about who technology is, it's about the interests that are associated with the operation of any given aspect of a technology or a technical system. Which means that it's a political act. The decision to create a technology is a political act, and that means that it can be changed really only through political acts. So we need to think then about um, technical syst uh, socio technical systems, energy systems as socio technical systems, uh, and we need then to think about realigning the way that technology works in terms of the organizational interest that it represents in terms of the economic system that it's embedded in, in terms of the rules that political uh, uh, authorities set for the operation of those economic systems. And then we have to think about the values and, and attitudes of the society. That's us. We are um, citizens, but we're also consumers. We're also workers. We're members of faith communities. And we exert tremendous influence over the functioning of political systems by our votes and by, uh, over economic systems by what we buy and how we organize in the marketplace. Those can have profound impacts over the way energy systems function. I've drawn this uh, graph here to represent the complexity and challenge of, of shifting to a smart grid system, which means taking the most complex uh, physical systems we have for uh, energy production and distribution, uh, and we combine them with the other most complex system we have, which is digital communications that operate in a worldwide scale. Um, the knowledge that is uh, available to people in each of those systems is tailored to the operation of those systems. And if you're asking for the development of new infrastructures that require a merging or an integration of 
the, of the two, then you're, going to, you're confronting the challenge of the complexity that exists that's exponentially greater than the complexity in, in each system by itself. So the challenge for the public then is to support a future that is vastly more complex than the present, where the past is no guide to the future, where social attitudes about consumption are, need to be dramatically reconfigured, and where we require a cultural awakening or an acceleration of a cultural movement that takes seriously different, very different patterns of material and energy consumption and use, uh, and that takes the notion of, of environmental stewardship quite differently than our Judeo-Christian tradition uh, has, um, has um, shaped us uh, to do. This is a generational issue. My students who are, like every student in college these days, what, 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, are going to bear the burden that we, our generations, older generations, have uh, created. Uh, it's a moral obligation. We have a moral obligation, not just because it's good for the bottom line, but because it's good for, uh, uh, it's good for us in a moral sense, and even religiously. If the pope is getting involved, then you can be sure there's a constituency here for a moral argument. So I'd like to conclude, uh, and I don't know how my time is, I've probably spent more than I should, um, and I apologize for that. I, the sense of urgency that I feel uh, about this, it keeps me up at night. It, it really does. Uh, it keeps my students up at night. Uh, and I hope it um, keeps you all up at least till late, working hard on these solutions, uh, because we need them more than ever. Um, the social capital that's being built here right now is absolutely vital to pressing forward on creating a, a just solution, one where we can address not just the technical challenges, but the economic, the political, the social, and the cultural challenges if we're going to have a nature that we can live in in the future. So thank you.